Greetings to you all in the name of Jesus, and welcome to Bible in a Year, day 152. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are privileged to see another day, thank God for it, and uh, that, that God made this day, that His divine power stretches throughout our day, that His grace is sufficient for us through this day. That's what I'm thankful for. Another opportunity to get into the Word of God, to put myself in position to grow. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. It doesn't matter the distraction. It doesn't matter the evil. It doesn't matter the hatred, the murder, the destruction, all of those things, all of the chaos that's happening out there. It's not going to stop me from getting closer to God. It's not going to stop me from getting into the word. I am not going to let that become a distraction to me. I refuse to allow myself to be consumed by these worldly affairs to the point to where I am distracted from doing what I love to do. And that's to get into the Word of God. That's to find myself in fellowship and in prayer. Now, I believe that we shouldn't be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. I think that it's important for us to pay attention to what's going on around us, but I don't think that we ought to let it bother us or disturb us to the point to where it consumes us and disrupts the flow of life that we are connected to. And that is the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So here we have another opportunity. I just want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, take heart, give your, give your heart to God in prayer concerning all of these things that are going on. Yes, we are in times of uncertainty, but anywhere there is an uncertainty, we have the Word of God that provides us with certainty. We can trust in Him and rest assured in the promises of God that He's going to be with us, that He's not going to allow anything to happen to us that isn't a part of His plan, that He's not going to be able to work out together for our good. We love God. And uh, I just want you to be encouraged. Just keep on keeping on. Keep on fighting the good fight. Don't be weary in well-doing. Even when you get tired, take a break. Refresh yourself. Get into the Word. Refresh yourself. Allow yourself to get some spiritual rest. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed. We have the ability to regulate that in most cases. I understand that there might be the rare exception that, well, I don't have any control. You know what? Perhaps this is possible. But I think in most cases, we have some type of say-so or input in regulating what we allow in and what we allow to disturb us and disrupt us. So maintain your focus on God by staying in the Word. If ever there was a time that we should allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to influence us, it is in the middle of all of this influence this nonsense that's going on. And when I talk about nonsense, I'm talking about the senseless rioting, the senseless destruction of property, and uh, the senseless crimes. I mean, we've got people that are fighting against innocent people, people that are attacking innocent people. Innocent people are getting hurt in the process of all of this, and that's just self-defeating for the overall purpose, and that is to save lives. Period. That's to save lives. That's to value and, and emphasize the preciousness of human life. So let's not get caught up in that evil. Let's maintain ourselves in the Word of God and do the best that we can to be vessels of His love and His power for His glory. If this is your first time tuning in to Bible in a Year, I want to be the first to welcome you. I'm excited that you have joined us. I want to encourage you to make a commitment to get into the Word of God 
and uh, join us on this journey. Get into the Bible every day. We've endeavored to read the entire Word of God in the year 2020. And what a time to do that. I mean, we've just got one thing after another, it seems, that is happening. We got to be in the Word. Either you can join us right here where we are from day 152, or if you have the mind and the discipline or the will and desire to go back to the beginning, then you can double up until you catch up. Either way, as long as you make a commitment, get into the Word of God. Now, I've got several scriptures here that I've chosen from the reading that I want to talk about and build on with you. So let's get into that. One of them, the first one is found in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. Now, I'm reading from the King James Version, as is custom for me to do. But you can, fo- you can feel free to follow along with whatever version you have or whatever version you are comfortable with. And this is what the Bible says. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And just to keep it blunt, raw, and real, there are some fools out there at these protests. There are fools out there rioting. I'm not saying that everybody out there is a fool. No, there are genuine people and they are there for a cause. However, there are people out there whose primary objective is to cause disruption, cause chaos, and to just start trouble. These are fools. So don't get caught up in the madness and the foolishness of being in a crowd of people acting that way. It's really easy to be carried away by the energy of the environment if we're not careful, if we let our guard down, if we're not watchful. We can get swept away by that energy. It's not very difficult. We have to be watchful. Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray so that they don't get carried away by the energy. Remember in the garden, of Gethsemane. I was going to say Garden of Eden. And I was a little earlier. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went to pray. This was after the Last Supper. Jesus took his disciples and Simon, John, and James. They went further with them. And then he went a little further than they did. And he went to pray. And the disciples fell asleep. And Jesus, when he came to them, he said, Hey, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. And we all know what happened to Peter. Peter got caught up in the hustle and the bustle and uh, attacked the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Peter got caught up in that energy. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in that energy. Not just with this rioting and this nonsense going on, which I've already defined, but also at work. Brothers, when we're hanging out at work and they're telling bad stories and they're engaged in sinful activity, joking and mocking, it's easy to get caught up in that energy. We've got to be careful. We've got to watch and pray. Ladies, when you're at the salon or at the nail shop and there's gossip going on, it's so easy to get caught up in the energy and in the flow of things if we're not paying attention. I mean, one one little distraction, one moment of taking our eyes off of where we're going, one moment of letting our guard down, and next thing you know, here we are participating and involved in a bunch of nonsense. Scripture warns us and says, But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Let us not be companions of fools. There are a lot of fools out there and they are blatant in their foolishness. It shouldn't be very difficult to see what a fool is doing or who is a fool. The Bible defines a fool. 
One of the definitions of a fool is a person that says that there is no God. Not just in open confession or acknowledgement, like you would think maybe an atheist, oh, there is no God. Uh, some of these atheists, they believe in God. <laughs> they just reject God and they're angry or something. But there are people out there who say that there is no God, not just verbally, but their actions are saying there's no God, there's no accountability, I don't believe in a God. Those people are fools. The Bible says that God watches everything, that God is just, God sees it all. So when we carry ourselves in a manner that says, oh, I don't care that God is watching, or I'm going to act like as if God was not watching, in essence, our behavior is saying that there is no God. There is no accountability. I'm not going to get judged. My works are not being recorded. That is foolish. And again, it, it can be easier than imagined to get caught away with the foolishness and the nonsense of fools. Let us be careful in how we conduct ourselves. Let us be careful when we congregate with other people. We have to be careful congregating with other people because that energy of fools, man, that spirit can influence us. And if we're not paying attention, perhaps find foothold if there be anything in us that this foolishness can respond to. I want to go to John chapter 20, verse 22. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is a day that we celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit of God, also known as the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. the Holy Ghost, if you're old school. The Holy Ghost. Here we have a situation where Jesus has appeared to his disciples after his death. Uh, well, after his resurrection, he's appeared to his disciples. And let's, let's take a look at what happens. And let's explore that idea and chop it up and unpack that a little bit to get a, a better look. The Bible says in John chapter 20, verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, <laughs> receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, the first thing that I want to point out is that there are groups of believers, denominations, that say, when Jesus did this, that's when the disciples received the Holy Ghost. And I would like to say, that is not true. Here is the reasoning. If this is where the disciples received the Holy Ghost, then in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, why would it emphasize that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost? Why don't we go there real quick? We've gone there before several times, if you've followed this ministry for some time. But let's go there again. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Boom. Acts 2. The Bible says, I'm reading Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The first thing that I notice here that I want to point out, it just jumps out and is, I think is worthy of mentioning, is that they, they had a unity. There was a oneness with them. This oneness uh, was an ideal condition for the Holy Ghost to come. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see here in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, that the disciples, the apostles, are filled with the Holy Ghost. They receive the Holy Ghost. Now, one could argue that, well, receive the Holy Ghost and be filled with the Holy Ghost is two different things. But there are several other scriptures that suggest otherwise. Uh, you can go to Romans chapter 8. 
<coughs> but there's a verse that I want to go to in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that is a little clearer. This is Jesus speaking. And um, this is right before his ascension. So logically, in, in, in the chronology of events, when Jesus breathed on him and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, that was before his ascension. Here, Jesus is on the Mount of Ascension, and it's in a different location. So, listen to what Jesus says. His apostles say to him, and he said unto them, or his apostles say, where? Where is that? Ba -ba 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 -ba. They're asking about the kingdom. Okay, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Which is what they were hoping all along. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So, even though Jesus said, he breathed on him and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 later. And I emphasize that because the issue ultimately is the speaking in tongues. Because there are denominations that speak against and teach against speaking in tongues. They say several things like, one, speaking in tongues isn't for today. It was only for the apostles. That's not true, because the apostles said in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, that the promise is unto you and to your children and to as many as afar, and to as many afar off as the Lord our God shall call. And the promise of the Holy Ghost came with speaking in tongues. That's a whole nother Bible study. And I haven't done a video on that yet. I've got tons of scripture, lots of evidence. I can break it down. I just haven't shot it yet. But that's not something that I'm going to get into this video. Um, if you want to know more about that, please harass me and press me sore saying, hey, Brother Klaus, do that. We want to hear that. I've been meaning to do it. I've been wanting to do that. I just haven't done it yet, right along with all the other projects that I haven't done. So if you are interested in hearing about the teaching of the Holy Ghost and tongues and why we say that tongues is the evidence of having received the Holy Ghost, there is a plethora of teaching. And if you're interested in that, let me know. And if there's, a, if there's enough um, demand for it, I guess I can probably expedite it and place it at a higher level of priority and, and get a video done. We can stay in communication. Post a comment or let me know in the comment section if that is something that appeals to you, if that's something that you're curious about or you just, hey, brother, I want to know more about this. Can we go over that? And let's see what can, let's see what comes of it. Praise God. So I want to emphasize because there are people that say that, see, this is where they received the Holy Ghost and you, they didn't speak in tongues right there. So their logic or argument is that, you know what, tongues is not the evidence of the Holy Ghost. But I believe that the Bible teaches that tongues is the evidence of having received the baptism of the Holy Ghost or having been filled with the Holy Ghost. And again, if you want to know about that, um, let me know in the comment section and we can tally up the votes. Glory be to God, the most high one that we serve. Uh, Shama. Let's go back to the Old Testament, shall we? Second Samuel. Uh, we're in Second Samuel. That's right. We finished the book of First Samuel. How many, how many books in the Old Testament have we knocked out now? Let's see. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Job. Don't forget, we read Job uh, and 1 Samuel. We've read 10 books uh, from the Old Testament. There are 39 books 
in the Old Testament, and we have read 10 of them. It's pretty powerful. We got 29 more books to go. But quite a few of those books are very short, like 12 of those books are rather short. Esther's a short book too. Uh, Nehemiah is not very long. So we'll breeze through the Old Testament. Anyways, we are now in 2 Samuel. This is the uh, beginning of the reign of David the king. We remember that David was anointed king, chased all throughout the wilderness by Saul. I mean, treated like a vagabond, drecks of society, him and his men. And Saul has died like Samuel predicted and prophesied, and his sons also. And so this is transpired, and that's how uh, 1 Samuel concluded. And here we find ourselves in 2 Samuel. And I'm at verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. Let's see what the Bible says. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Oh, yeah. Uh, the reason why I pointed this out is because here is one of, I think, a couple mentions of the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher is a historical account of exploits and acts of the children of Israel. Uh, remember reading in Joshua that uh, the Bible accounted that when Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, the Bible accounted or the book of Judges accounted saying, is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the book of Jasher also has record of this account. It's a biblically endorsed text. Now, I'm not here to argue authenticity. I'm simply pointing out that men of God who God used to inspire his word took teachings from the book of Jasher. So, it could be possible that the book of Jasher was God-breathed, God-inspired. It is a biblically endorsed book, the book of Jasher. It's an interesting read. The book of Jasher provides a lot of details that are left out. For example, we come into the story of Abraham when God speaks to him and says, hey, get up and leave and go to a place that I'm going to show you. And just like that, Abraham goes. No backstory. We don't know what's going on. We just, boom, the man has faith. But the book of Jasher adds some insights all the way from Abraham's birth and talks about Abraham's life up until the point to where God calls him. And reading this account gives us some understanding that explains some of Abraham's behavior. Because certainly, when we read in Genesis, it appears that Abraham already has some kind of knowledge of God. Why? Because he believes in God. Abraham was a man of faith, and the Bible says that faith uh, comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He had to have known of God or had some type of knowledge of God in order for him to exercise faith in him. Why else would a man just up and leave because some God shows up and says, hey, get up and go? They go, I don't know you. Who are you? There's no explanation given to Abraham's knowledge. So these books can color in a little bit of the details that help to make what you read in the canonized version, uh, more sense. Now, some people might be reading from the Apocrypha. That's a whole different story. I, I have an opinion on that that I have not yet proved through research and study, and I think it better to keep that to myself at this moment. However, the book of Enoch is also another biblically, blah, 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 biblically endorsed text. And... Uh, that the Bible quotes from or that the Bible references in light of what it's already talking about. Glory be to God. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. The Bible says this, 
And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. So they've come to anoint David to be king. And uh, I have to wonder, when David was first anointed king by Samuel, which by the way now has passed away as we know, I wonder how did David imagine his inauguration? Did he imagine that Saul was there? Did he imagine Jonathan still alive? Did he imagine that Saul was going to forfeit over the kingdom and say, hey, you know what? You're the rightful king. I'm resigning. I renounce the crown and I'm crowning you king. We don't know what David had in mind, but I imagine, and this comes from personal experience, that perhaps it isn't what David imagined. Perhaps the way David experienced it, the way it unfolded may not have been the way that David imagined it. Here, uh, Israel suffered a travesty with the death of Saul. Saul was Israel's first king. There was some type of sentiment and emotional attachment to that idea. All of Israel wept. David and his mighty men wept and fasted for Saul and for Jonathan. I certainly think or tend to embrace the idea that perhaps David saw himself having a lifelong friendship with Jonathan. Perhaps he saw them growing old together. And yet, reality played out and Jonathan has died in warfare. Jonathan has perished. So Jonathan isn't there. Jonathan knew that David was going to be king. And he was okay with that. He knew that this was the will of God and he embraced it and yielded to it, submitted to it, is what he did. Even Saul knew that David was going to be the king. Maybe Saul's intention was to eventually hand over the kingdom and he didn't know that he was going to die. That's a tough place to be. It almost seems like, God, you're kind of unfair with Saul, almost as if because you didn't have Saul in mind, you didn't show him a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. The Bible does say that I will shew, I will shew mercy on whom I will shew mercy. Maybe Saul was not a recipient of mercy like that. Perhaps because Saul maybe wasn't his intended king from the get-go. He simply allowed it because he knew well, you know what? I'm going to use this situation to develop David. Could God have done it another way? Of course. God is a genius, a mastermind. But he is able to make all things work together for good according to his plan. So if you find yourself in life right now where things don't look like you imagined they should be, Maybe you feel like I'm not where I should be. I feel like I should be further along in life. God is able to work out all things for your good. The ticket is, let us continue to trust in God. And this sometimes requires an effort on our part to petition the throne. I think, and this is my opinion, I need all the grace that I can get to embrace what God is trying to do. Because no matter how willing I am, flesh isn't always as cooperative as my mind. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. God bless you all and see me in the next video.